Hello there and welcome everybody. Thanks very much for joining us for today's APMG webinar in partnership with the Big Data Framework. My name is Estelle Hicks-Bennett and I'll be your host and moderator today. I'm delighted to be joined by presenter Jan Millen Middleberg, founder of the Big Data Framework and author of several books, including the Enterprise Big Data Framework Guidance Series. He's a pioneer and advocate for professionalization in automation and big data and when not in lockdown can frequently be found delivering keynote speeches or moderating at universities and technology conferences around the world. Before I hand over, I'm just going to say to you that the recording of this webinar will be sent to you via email afterwards for, um, and will be sent to everybody that's registered. Uh, we will be taking questions at the end, so please do engage, chat, comment and ask questions throughout and we can, we can uh, address these at the end. If you want to get the most out of it, then it's your questions that we want to answer. With regards to feedback, we welcome all feedback, positive and constructive, as it helps us to ensure we're providing the right content for you. So please do share your thoughts with us. It's great to have you with us today, and I'm going to hand you over now to Jamila Middelberg. Thank you. Thank you, Estelle, and thank you so much for the kind introduction, as always. It's a great pleasure to be back on the, this uh, APMG webinar. I really look forward to sharing something with the audience today about understanding big data analysis. Um, before we get started, uh, let me take a brief moment to, to introduce myself and also to make these webinars very engaging. I always welcome any kinds of uh, feedback and questions on the chat. So if it's correct, you see a chat window in, um, in the screen in front of you. So uh, I would be very interested to know where everybody's participating from uh, today around the globe. I myself am located in Kuala Lumpur. So if, if you take a moment to fill in the chat, the location that you are, uh, and if you have any other questions during the webinar, please feel free to use the chat window as well. Estelle will be moderating all of these questions that we uh, will see coming in. Um, and towards the end of this session, we will um, go through the questions one by one and provide some Q&A to any of the questions or concerns that you may have. So that's a, a quick big bit of introduction. Let's have a look at what we're going to be talking about today. A very brief agenda of all of the topics that we're going to be discussing today. Obviously, this uh, session is going to be about enterprise big data analysis. So what we're really gonna try to do in this webinar is take it one level deeper beyond the introductory stuff and generic information about what big data is. What I'm going to try to you uh, try to do is zoom in specifically on the big data analysis process. What do we mean with process? Well, big data in any organization is a sequential um, number of processes that you need to walk through. And in order to build up capability and to do this better over time, it's really good to start thinking about getting an, a, getting analysis done in terms of a process. So there's a number of steps that you really need to go through. And what this is going to be the main topic of today. What I will also do is try to illustrate this webinar today in an example that is going to be a real life case study. So what we will do is I will also um, quit the presentation halfway through and go through a um, example in which we will actually run through an analysis itself. So you get a bit of a feel what it takes to be busy with big data on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, after that, we will um, uh, present you with some uh, steps and some information on how you can get started on this by yourself. Um, and I'll also share my experience in the last seven or eight years that I've been doing this and how you can get started, uh, what will be the first steps to take. Um, all of the things I'm presenting today are based on the book that you see on the right, which is called the Enterprise Big Data Analyst Level, which is also part of the APMG certification series. So I'll, I'll guide you through that and uh, showcase to you where you can download all of the materials and the scripts that we, uh, we, we are showcasing today. Then towards the end of the session, we'll do a, a Q&A session Again, we really welcome any kinds of questions in the chat that you see on the right, um, because then we can go um, and moderate all of those together. 
Good, so let's get started on the actual session itself. Before we begin, um, this is more of an advanced kind of uh, webinar series. So uh, let's do a very brief recap about uh, one of the previous presentations that I did so that you can kind of place enterprise big data analysis into the right context. And that context is to look at big data in any kind of organization from a framework perspective. The whole framework is called the Enterprise Big Data Framework, and you see a very high-level summary here in uh, front in the slides in front of you. Any big data organization needs to start with a strategy, and that's really what you see at the core of the framework. And from that strategy onwards, organizations can build up capabilities into a number of different fields in order to get real value from their data. So things that are going to need are architecture, algorithms, processes, and functions, that really showcase how you can work with big data on a day-to-day -day basis. If you have all of those in place, there's also room to start experimenting with artificial intelligence because they build upon the same architecture processes and algorithms that are partly discussed in the big data framework. Uh, obviously, you might wonder where is the focus then in particularly in big data analysis. So obviously that's going to be within the big data architecture and algorithm section. And what I will be doing today is focus more towards those areas of the big data framework. So those are a little bit more depicted towards the right of the framework. And that's really how we build it up. So um, in order to do data analysis well, you need to have knowledge about fundamental algorithms and you need to understand how do you actually retrieve value from data? Because especially in big data sets, the information is so large that it's really no use to, to scroll through all of the, the data and get an understanding from it um, immediately. You need to apply those algorithms over time. So um, all of the information that I'm gonna be presenting to you today is coming out of the Enterprise Big Data Analyst book, as mentioned before. Uh, this is the second book out of a series of five. Um, uh, in the previous webinars, we discussed the, the big data professional level. Um, so the analyst one is more of an applied data science kind of course. How do you get the value out of the data? And that's really what I'm going to be sharing with you today. What are the sequential steps that you need to go through in order to get that value out of those data sets? So if you want to have more information afterwards, I highly recommend to download this guide. It's available for free, so um, um, it's definitely worth your while to review that. So let's get started. Um, you might ask yourself the following question. Well, why data analysis and why particularly big data analysis? Well, let me start with a, with a bit of a um, uh, context first. First of all, we need to note that data analysis in itself is not something new. It has been around as early as the ancient Egyptians and the early Romans who already did uh, different techniques and produced different kinds of algorithms to analyze the data that they were building with. So uh, one of the really famous uh, statisticians in the world, Mr. J.W. Tukey, which I really like because it has the same initials as I have, um, has already was one of the first pioneers in this field and really started to define uh, data analysis. Because for a very long time, um, data analysis was similar or equivalent to statistics. And uh, that's definitely everybody's favorite subject in high school. So it was really uh, becoming more popular and it needed to have a different kind of uh, interpretation. And one of the sentences that, that really started the whole domain of data analysis was in a, uh, in a paper that he published in 1962, in which he, he has said that basically the whole field of statistics is transfer, uh, transferring to data analysis. And why that's so very interesting is that really changed the whole perspective on how people look at data analysis. Um, because for a really long time, this was really only done at universities and schools and by professors. Whereas nowadays, data analysis is, is part of the DNA of every company. So as data analysis, he said that basically that includes all of the procedures for analyzing data, but also the techniques for interpreting the results of such procedures. 
And that's exactly what we're going to be focusing on today. What are the procedures that you need to take in order to become a good data analyst? Um, on top of all that, uh, you might think, well, why is this then so interesting today? Well, that is because data analysis is now possible to do it on big data. And what we really mean with that is analyzing, for instance, all kinds of Facebook graphs, uh, Twitter feeds, um, thousands or millions of transactions at, at the same time, and making these real-time decisions. And that's really what you can do uh, with this big data analysis. And that's why it's also such a fascinating um, area to specialize yourself into. And I'll showcase some examples of that a little bit later onward. If we look at data analysis versus big data analysis, we can still say that today, most of the principles that were uh, true in the paper in 1962 are as true today as they were in 1962. There is, however, a big change that happened in the meantime, and that is obviously the production of data. Everybody who has a cell phone in their pocket produces data 24 by 7, and that volume has seen an exponential growth in the last couple of years, both in terms of volume as well as the variety. So whereas uh, data analysis traditionally begins with neatly organized data, which we refer to as structured data, there's nowadays all kinds of um, data that is produced by sensors or by phones or through social media posts, which add an additional layer of complexity and that need to be analyzed in a different way. And we refer to that as unstructured data. So it's literally been growing so exponentially in the last couple of years that it is sometimes really difficult to make sense of it all. And for that particular reason, it is also really good to start introducing a process because literally you could spend the rest of your life analyzing data that is being produced just on today. And you would still don't have enough time to complete all of that. So what uh, big data analysis tries to do is also apply focus. And that focus is specifically tailored towards an enterprise perspective meaning what is the value that you can get out of uh, big data from an organizational point of view. And I think that this is uh, something with, uh, in my experience, that I've seen a lot of companies struggle with. They're buying some fancy tools, they're setting up a big data department, but they have tremendously uh, difficulty in realizing business benefits. And this is where a process comes in because a, pro a process um, focuses the attention of the people working in big data and it also uh, structures towards achieving a particular result. So this is the, the process oriented nature that we're going to be talking about um, and that is what you see on a very high level depicted in the picture at the bottom of the screen where we move from the business objective which is what is the overall goal of this particular uh, exercise towards the different steps throughout the stages of the big data uh, life cycle. So we start with ingesting data, then preparing it, then the analysis itself, and then finally move towards presentation. And if we zoom in a little bit further into this very simple five set, uh, stage process, we can dive a little bit further into it and see that it consists of actually some additional layers of complexity and some ad additional layers of depth. So at the top of the slide, you see basically those five st same stages, again, moving all the way from the business objective that the particular organization tries to solve through the use of data towards the ingestion preparation and analysis stages, which together are referred as the data pipeline, and then to the actual management summary, which is at the presentation layer. And this is where we get the real value out of the data from reports, visualizations, or real time in the form of dashboards. But the interesting part from a, a data analysis point of view is obviously in that middle part between the, the objectives and the presentations. And that is, how do you build uh, effective data pipelines that are able to um, analyze different types of data, um, make sure that they are adequately analyzed, uh, and also ensure that the 
correct algorithms are applied to them so that they can retrieve that, um, that value. And we all do that in terms of on massive quantities of data. And in, in order to do that, you would need to have distributed storage and processing uh, methods and methodologies and technology in place. Uh, that's a little bit out of scope for the, the session today, but it's really good to know that that exists and ties into some of the other modules of the big data framework. All of these steps, uh, especially in an organizational context, are very um, are embedded into a number of or integrated with a number of other frameworks because throughout all of these steps in the data pipeline, we really need to think about things like security, governance, and ethics. And uh, these topics uh, are increasingly more important uh, today um, because you, know, you just need to open up any local newspaper and you see that data theft and hacking are um, more common than those. So those are also aspects you need to take into consideration. So basically what we do in the big data analysis process is we move from the left here all the way to the right and uh, we will consider different types of business objectives and then also couple them towards different analysis techniques. And you already see some of them here on, on the screen where you can have different focus areas to have different types of results from your data. So those are things like inference, regression, classification, clustering and outlier detection, which are some of the major areas of algorithms and analysis techniques that can be used to retrieve that value. So how does that work in a more practical nature? Well, this um, webinar is called um, Understanding the Big Data Analysis Process. So what I've tried to do for today is kind of walk you through what are those five steps that we've seen on the previous slide and also to illustrate that with some of the examples in a practical nature. So what the big data framework really tries to do is to, to showcase you the theory of how this is done, but also take a number of more practical steps in terms of showing how each and every algorithm works and how you can apply it to solve a particular business problem. And what really makes you a good data analyst is if you are able to combine the right type of algorithm towards a particular business problem. And by understanding the data, for instance, are we talking about discrete values or not, or is it, is it factor values? By understanding the underlying data that is beneath the business problem, to also understand the differences between those algorithms. So why would one algorithm work in a particular um, area, whereas another algorithm would be less suitable? And why is one particular algorithm more accurate, for example, than another one? And if you start practicing with this over and over again, you see that the more experience you gain, the more um, useful it is, or the more um, capable you are with selecting the right types of algorithms automatically. And that's really what we try to do in the, um, the courses and the materials as well. We want you to focus on, are you able to solve a particular business problem by understanding all of its underlying data and underlying algorithms? And I think that makes it really valuable because you won't get the solution presented to you in an organization either. So you need to really analyze uh, that particular process. So we'll showcase a little bit on how that works today. Let's start with the first stage after we've defined the business problem, and that is that of data ingestion. Because before you can even start to analyze anything, you should have first have access to the data. And that is sometimes easier said than done because data can be buried into databases, which are either uh, in remote repositories or within your own organization, or it might even be data that is controlled and managed by an external organization. Think about Twitter data or Facebook data. You really need to interact with that through um, uh, prescribed APIs in order to, to act, get access to that data in, in, on a real-time basis. So in this first stage, you really need to make sure that you bring all your data sources together and formulate the way in which you can solve your business problem by combining different sources of data. So 
uh, what you need to, to get an understanding of as a data analyst is really how do you use different data sources and you can think about um, um, very simple examples like your excel sheets and text files etc but if we're really talking about big data which in, in most cases it is um, just local um, reading is just not going to be good enough because the, the beta data sets are, are frequently just too big so that automatically brings us to also understanding how you connect to remote databases which are either your enterprise databases or somewhere some external databases that are stored in clouds or for instance to read online uh, data sets so you also need to understand techniques with which you can for instance scrape um, data from internet websites or to automatically download and read data um, from um, web resources that are out there. Um, one of the examples I frequently use is if you um, if you go to the website data.gov.uk you see literally hundreds of thousands of data sets that are presented by the UK government and that you can interact with for free. Um, you could, of course, manually start to download all of those data sets, save them on your computer, and then start your analysis. But if you really want to do things like real time and you want to make sure that the data is updated every time, then that process is, is, is way too manual. So you would need to build some kind of an, a script that can automatically retrieve the latest data set from that website in order to read and analyze that. So that's some of the things that you would need to understand in that ingestion phase. Having the data is one thing, but then you also, of course, need to have the certainty that that data set is accurate. And that brings us to the, the second phase, which is really about data cleaning and data wrangling. So let me explain the difference between those two. Data cleaning is really the process of cleaning up your data and getting rid of corrupt or inaccurate records. In the perfect world, this would not be necessary. But as if, if you've been working in enterprise for a longer period of time, you will know that most databases are um, uh, have a lot of corrupt or inaccurate records very frequently because people didn't fill them in or they, they make mistakes when uh, doing data entry. So first of all, you need to really sh make sure that your data is uh, as clean as possible and that passes certain tests so that you know that the data that you're working with is actually valid. And this is one of the most important parts to ensure that your results later on work get accepted by management. Because if the data is questioned, and you see this happening quite a lot in newspapers and in companies as well, if people don't trust the underlying data set and you cannot prove that this data is correct, then the end results will be questioned. So that's the data cleaning part. The data wrangling part is basically making sure that it can be analyzed consistently. So this is done by applying certain standards towards your data. So that if, for instance, if you're, uh, if you're combining different sources from different parts of the world, that you have consistently the same results. And a very good example is always to think about the difference between, for instance, Europe and the US in the way that they uh, work with numbers in terms of points and commas in, in for thousands of um, or se thousand separations. So if you make mistakes there, then you're gonna get some really uh, um, uh, diff uh, different results. So this is really what we do in data wrangling. So we make sure that uh, data in different sorts come in and that's what you see in, in, uh, in the picture as well. Uh, and that afterwards it's all in a very structured and ordered nature. So that's the, the, the second step that we discuss and that you need to know as a good data analyst. And then comes the, the most difficult part, I would say, is the data analysis itself. So in order to do that, you need to have algorithms and you need to understand how do you crunch the numbers in a, um, to solve a particular business problem. And in um, the first part of this data analysis guide, we cover a number of the most common data science techniques and with most common, I mean, um, this is, I would say, this solves 80% of, of the most common business questions. So we talk about the different things like detecting um, outliers, which could, for instance, be used to detect fraud, or to do things like classification and, and combining different products together, 
or we can talk about regression for making future predictions about pricing, et cetera, et cetera. We don't have the time to go into depth of all those algorithms today, um, but what we really try to do, if, if you're interested in that, is to get a bit of an understanding beyond the basics. So for instance, if you look at the, this next slide, you can see that, for instance, classification is a very common type of algorithm that you would need to apply to solve a particular business problem. But within classification algorithms, there are a number of different techniques. And um, it's imperative that you will, as a data analyst, that you know what are the differences between those algorithms and a particularly when should I use a particular algorithm to solve a particular question? So that's what really makes a good data analyst is, is knowing what those algorithms mean and being able to select the, the right one. So for instance, for classification, we talk about things like k-nearest neighbor, naive base, logistic regression and classification trees. And all of these are different types of techniques, um, but they are all classification algorithms. So. Also in the uh, exam that we uh, developed with APMG, this is basically uh, what you would need, the kinds of problems that you would need to solve on your actual examination. And given a, a particular case study or a particular problem, are you able to apply the right type of algorithm to solve that particular problem? And this is how we go through all these uh, different examples in real, real time. So, um, what I'm going to do in the next couple of minutes is just to give you a very brief overview of one of the techniques within classification. So uh, we already talked about uh, classification a little bit. Basically, this is assigning a class towards a particular uh, category to a unknown data point, which we refer to as an observation. The classic example of classification is obviously how email is treated in your inbox where it is either classified as a spam email um, or whether it goes to your regular mailbox. The algorithm um, that your spam filter uses is actually a classification solution, where it's a very simple question. Every email that comes in that we um, don't know what it is, we need to either classify it as spam or not spam. So that's really the classic example to uh, explain classification. However, if you think about that a little bit more deeply, you can see that classification is really used as an example of recognizing a pattern. So you can also use it for diagnosis diseases, which is um, something that is very relevant in today's day and age, um, or for instance, to assign a particular um, marketing campaign to a group of customers. All of these kinds of problems can be solved through classification. And uh, we will give you a very simple example today. So here you see my previous example uh, of how email works. Basically, a lot of messages come into your inbox and then we use a classification algorithm, which is referred to as a classifier. And then we separate them into two classes. This, these could be two classes, could be three, could be five, could be, could be dozens of different classes. This is highly dependent on how you specify it. These kinds of examples um, sound very simple and also things like um, uh, email spam has been around for, for decades, so that's not really a very exciting kind of topic. But did you also know that a classification is, is used in exactly the same way, for instance, for more common day techniques like facial recognition? And remember the slide that I presented all the way at the beginning, which showed you the image of the big data framework? where you saw these outer layer of AI. And if you understand big data well, you will see that AI is basically a next step that works on exactly where I would say most of the common algorithms that are used in order to solve big data questions. So things like facial recognition work in, work in the same way, in the sense that your face is being broken down into a number of data points, and those data points are subsequently classified against a database with known pictures um, where they will try to make a match based upon uh, the pixels that they have in the photograph in front of you. So um, that's the same technique. And if you're um, um, getting experience in this particular topic, you will see the commonalities between many of the day-to-day -day, uh, problems that you will encounter 
and these very standardized algorithms that can be used by any type of organization. And I think that's where the real value is as a data analyst. So um, moving back to the example that we're going to discuss, if we look at those types of classifiers, uh, we want to make sure that we classify an incoming value into a particular class. And the example that we're gonna be talking about today is called the, the example or the algorithm of K nearest neighbor. And that basically uh, is a very simple example of, um, that can be explained in the following way. If you look in the slides in front of you, you see a, a data point, which is, is green. And if this were to be uh, uh, an email or for instance, a, a, a facial recognition problem, the key question would be, if you, if you look at that data point and especially the coordinates, um, which would be represented by the uh, two different data points, would you classify this dot as blue or would you classify it as purple? And that's basically a very simplistic way of explaining what is the problem that we're trying to solve. And in this particular uh, problem, uh, with this particular algorithm, we would classify this data point as a data point that would be blue. Why is this the case? Well, in this case, we specify K as three, um, and that means that we will look towards the three closest uh, data points that are the most uh, close to the green data point. And this is also why the, the algorithm is called K nearest neighbors, because we're literally looking at the nearest neighbors of every data point. And obviously, because there's two data points that are in blue uh, are closest to the one that's in green, this data point is also automatically classified as a blue data point. Well, you can see that this is a very simplistic way of explaining a bit more of a complex algorithm, um, because in this case, we only have two different axes. We have an X1 and an X2. But you can imagine that for large data sets, these, there could be hundreds or even thousands of variables that can be used to classify it. So this is really um, a more common way of doing this. So there's obviously a mathematical formula. I'm gonna leave that for now. Um, but this is uh, the very simple um, uh, Pythagorean triangle that we all learned in high school, which is A square is B square plus C square. Um, so even though it might, this formula might look a little bit complex, it's nothing else than that. So it's in, in basically you already learned this in high school. It's just applied now towards a bit more of a, a larger scale type of problem. So this kind of algorithm is part of a class that we refer to as supervised machine learning. So we have raw data that is coming in, could be customers, could be information about people, could be um, uh, messages on a, on a different type of platform. We build this particular algorithm and then we put every um, message or every raw data point into a particular class. So you might ask yourself this, uh, the question, well, this is all very nice from a, a theoretical point of view, but how can I actually use this in practice? And, and how can I uh, get some business benefit out of it, this? So we prepared a, a bit of a little case study for this webinar. Um, and this is, um, I think something that we all like to do is have a good glass of wine uh, nowadays. What is the problem that we're trying to solve um, and that a lot of supermarkets or big re um, retailers try to solve is well, how do I determine the quality of a bottle of wine? And wouldn't it be very interesting if I could determine the quality of a bottle of wine just by looking at the ingredients that that bottle has? And now take this problem to another level and think about if you have two large grocery chains and they could start making purchasing decisions of, of wines just by looking at the ingredients that are on the bottles of wine. What, wh which kind of grocery store would you think would be more successful? The one that makes decisions based upon this particular algorithm 
or the one that just um, uh, goes to the, the nearest suppliers and things that that is the best quality. Well, this case study has actually been done and it appears that if you, if you consistently make these types of data-driven decisions, you will outperform your competition. And this is really also the answer to the business problem that we're trying to solve. So let's see how this works and what is the kind of work you would need to do as a data analyst and how you could do this, this, this over time. In order to simplify this example a little bit, you would need to know that if we look at wine, there's almost always information about wine available in terms of the acidity, the citric acid, the amount of sugar that's in it, the pH values, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't need to be a very detailed expert to understand all of this. This is just to say that based on this, we're going to classify every bottle of wine into four main categories. And then we've kind of simplified it uh, to make sure that the, the, the experiment runs. So we could say that a bottle of wine is either poor quality, if people would rate it a four or five, medium, six or seven, good, eight or nine, or exceptional level of quality. So basically the question that we're trying to solve is without ever having the, tasted the bottle of wine and based on its chemical composition, would you be able to rate a bottle of wine in terms of its quality? And that's really the problem that we're trying to solve. And we can use a data analysis approach in order to do that. Um, and that's what I'm gonna showcase to you now. So I'm gonna try to run a bit of a live demo. I know that there's always some risk that might go wrong. Um, so um, I've, uh, what I've done is I've made a, um, a small subset, so it's not really a big data set, but that's just to make sure that it keeps running on my machine uh, and that we don't spend 15 minutes waiting for the results to, to compile. So basically what we would do, and this is also what you would learn in a data analyst course, is how you go through this particular problem. So I'll very, for the sake of time, I'm very quickly going to show you some of the steps. Don't worry about anything of the code here. We're gonna be making this available at the end of the webinar. So if you wanna practice with this, um, you can go right ahead after that. So the way that it will work is first of all, you need to uh, import a data set with bottles of wine. And that is something that we would do um, um, in the first stage that we discussed where we ingest data. So this is really where we're getting data from different sources. So in this case, this is a, is a public data set. And if we look at data, at that data, we could see that there's all these different kinds of uh, variables or factors that are determining what is the composition of the wine. And if we look at that a little bit more detail in more of an Excel kind of uh, format, you could see that we could say there's the different bottles of white wine, they have different levels of acidity, as sugar, chlorides, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and all of these say something about the wine that is in that particular bottle. So what we will do next is that we're just gonna be looking at bottles that have red wine. And this is just to make sure that we have a bit of a, a more homogeneous kind of data set. So we'll classify those as the bottles of red wine. And now we see that we've made a subset of the bottles of red wine. We have just 15, uh, close to 1600 bottles um, but it's enough to showcase kind of this example. What we will then do is that we're gonna add labels to ward each of those different bottles to determine the quality based on the ranking that people gave previously. So this is what we do in the next line. And then we're going to separate the two, the data set into something with which we're going to build our model on, which is what we refer to as our training set. And then we're gonna split the rest into a test set. To, and this is done to determine how accurate the model is that we're going to build. So this is exactly what we will do in the next section. So you see that it runs, you see that uh, we, we um, separate it into tests and training sets. And the uh, next is the most important line and this is where we're going to be making our classification model. And basically what we're doing here is nothing else than building um, the model that, we're, that we would like to use. So I'll run that, that as well. And here we see that we use a particular library for classification and that's basically just a plugin into this program that will showcase how you can do that. 
And what we're doing here is that we will use the KNN algorithm, which is exactly the same methodology that I just showed you, in order to do that. So if we do that uh, um, uh, very quickly, we see that we're now building this particular class. And we, we can now start to predict how accurate it is with our bottles of wine. And then we can run a number of different tests. We could say, well, we're gonna look at the nearest data point and just at the nearest data point only. And we would say that that is just one data point and therefore it's K is one. So if we very quickly do that, and just to showcase you some of the results, we can see that we're building a very quick table here that says, well, uh, based upon the, class, the test class data, would a particular bottle of wine, based on the chemical composition of the wine, be predicted as good, medium, or poor, versus whether it's actually good, medium, or poor? And what that shows is that we would like to have all of the values in the in the in the center. So we all of the if every bottle would be classified correctly, then uh, all the good values would be here, and there would be all the values here would be zero. So we could say that this is a decent model, but for instance, here we see there's still 138 and 104 bottles that are. Uh, misclassified or which are not classified correctly. So that's not a very good um, um, model at all. You can also see that that amounts to a percentage of 60, 67% uh, or 57% on average. So that's really um, a, a first initial step. What we can then do, and I'm just going to run all of this um, right after, um, uh, right away, uh, for the sake of time, is that we run the exact same exper experiment with a number of different uh, values of k. And remember that k is the data points, the number of data points that we're looking at, which are closest to the unknown data point. And if we do that, we see that the, the, with every step, we see that the, the values are actually rising, moving up towards uh, almost 61%. So this is the kinds of things that you would need to learn in order to become an effective data analyst and in order to get some and make some sense out of your data. And I know that this is just a very short example, but if you have more questions on how to do this afterwards, I'm gonna showcase you some, some files and reference documentation where you can start to learn a little bit uh, more about it. For the sake of time, I'm just going to, to end this demo here and move on with some of the last elements of the, the webinar presentation. Uh, but uh, obviously you can learn a lot more about these kinds of things. So let me just uh, quickly switch back to the slides. So um, based on these kinds of problems, you could really start to work with problems that you see in the real world. And uh, if there's one conclusion from the previous experiment, it's really to make sure that you don't uh, go to the supermarket and buy a poor bottle of wine because life's way too short to drink that wine. So this is just an example of all the different kinds of techniques that you will learn, need to learn in order to become a good data analyst. Um, and as a data analyst, there's lots of other kinds of examples. So. For instance, we've just looked now at the quality of wine based on the composition. But for instance, other very sim similar problems that we could use with these kinds of classification algorithms. If, if we look at 100,000 uh, customers of a uh, telco provider, can we um, classify them into four or five different groups based on their preferences and based on their behavior? And that will be very effective if you would like to make a marketing campaign that is targeted to each one of those customers individually. Another very famous example based on classification is if you look at the public data that is available on a website for housing, um, based on this data and the number of square feet in the area and the postal codes, et cetera, could you build a classification algorithm which kind of house you would need to buy and which houses are undervalued or overvalued? So doing data analysis in itself is a really fun kind of exercise because it gives you insight into these different kinds of problems and especially how you solve them 
And if you've done this kind of analysis, the final step is that you start to visualize that and that you make sure that people who have, don't necessarily have a data science background or who don't necessarily are data experts, that they start to be able to, under, uh, to understand what has been calculated and that they are able to see the results and make decisions that are in line with the data as well. So in the final section that you need to understand as a data analyst is, well, how do you effectively present data? Because keep in mind, in most cases, we're analyzing millions and millions of records. So it's really difficult to visualize that all into a graph that makes sense and that people also can understand. So in the last part of um, uh, understanding how, how you can do data analysis, we will talk a lot about how do you do visualization techniques? How do you make sure that you convey um, very large quantities of data into some summaries that people will understand and that they also understand how accurate that particular model is? So that's kind of the steps that you would walk through in order to become a data analyst. Um, and what I've done in the, in the last 40, 45 minutes is really give you a very a quick uh, and I hope an in-depth overview of what are the steps you go through as a data analyst. And this is all outlined obviously in the book um, that I wrote, uh, which is the Enterprise Big Data Analyst. And this is something that which we launched with APMG in the first quarter of this year. And you can download a free copy of that book on the following link, which is bigdataframework.org slash resources. And obviously, um, there is now also an exam available for that. So um, after you've read the book and you've practiced with all the different examples, you can take the APMG exam. It's, uh, it's a tough exam. It's, uh, it's two and a half hours. So it's, um, um, it, it really goes in depth. And that's all because it's case study based. So what we really try to do is build um, a common understanding of what are the good qualities of a data analyst and how can you, if you aspire to become one, how can we make sure that that level of testing is consistent? So it's a, it's a bit of a, um, a heavy, more heavy type of exam um, in which you will run through a number of cases um, and apply some of the things that we've just seen in the previous slides as well. Um, you can use the self-study option, but obviously um, there's lots of APMG uh, training partners across the world that offer these types of courses. And last time I checked, I think uh, there's uh, ATOs on every single continent um, and uh, there's um, literally um, training being offered in your region almost every month. So if you want to learn more about that, I highly recommend that you visit the APMG International website and look for a training partner in your area who could do this uh, either in a virtual or in a more online form so that they, so you have an instructor that can walk you through all of the different types of examples. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, it's a bit of a tough, tough exam in the sense that it's two and a half hours. Um, it's 80 questions, um, so it's, um, it's uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, but we wanted to make sure that there's really this international standard for what makes a good enterprise big data analyst. And I think we, uh, with this model and the uh, big data analysis uh, process that we've just discussed, that we kind of succeeded in this, in this particular area. Um, and you will receive the digital badge, which you see on the slide here for your LinkedIn resume, as soon as you su successfully completed the examination. So um, that's it from my particular uh, point of view. I hope you found this webinar useful. And I think I would like now to hand back to Estelle to moderate some of the, the questions that have come in during the session. And I would also like to invite everybody who's on the call and that has any questions to now type them into the chat window so that we can run through the, these last couple of questions in the last five minutes that we have for this webinar. That's great. Thank you so much, Jan Willem. Well, what an amazing amount of information that you have managed to pack into this webinar. I'm just, I'm, I'm blown away. Thank you so very much indeed. Um, 
it's great to see the sort of outcomes and those visualizations that you can get at the end. It, you know, it's clearly very complicated, but uh, that we are addressing um, hopefully our future data scientists here and analysts. Um, so, one of the uh, one of the first questions uh, is from Katie. She's on a project where their only tool is to uh, their only tool to analyze data is on spreadsheets. Is there a way that you can speed up data validation and transformation into a specific format without having to do it manually? Um, yes, the obvious answer um, uh, to that question. Um, the whole process of uh, data cleaning and data wrangling that we've um, shown somewhere halfway through the slide, those are techniques with which you can uh, massively and very, very quickly do these kinds of things. The tool that I showed you uh, throughout this webinar um, is called R and specifically R Studio. And the reason that we've chosen these kinds of technology, of these tools is that they're available for free online and that they integrate with Excel. So um, um, what I've uh, done a lot of different times before is that um, if there's an Excel kind of problem and it either takes too long or it's too tedious to do it, is I've just built a bridge between uh, the, the, the software I used um, in, the, in the demo now, which is called R, which you can download for free and install for free. And um, um, it's actually quite amazing that that is all available for free. And then build the integration with your uh, Excel file. And then um, uh, what R does is that it is um, based for, uh, or it's, built completely to add, to analyze large set of data so it does that like within seconds uh, so something which would otherwise have taken you 15 20 minutes to do that um in r will be done within seconds and especially in order to to clean data or get it into the right format there is uh, data wrangling techniques within uh, r available that make this very very quick so i hope that helps that's great, Emmeline. Thank you very much. And um, this isn't one of the questions, but I'm going to throw it in. I I do understand that this can be this level can be done virtually, can it? And online. I'm not saying specifically who does it, but it can be done virtually and online if yes. people want to. Yeah. Okay. So yes. So you, we you take we leave the accreditation obviously to APMG, but I think um, in today's world, um, I would say that more courses are being done virtually than um, uh, in a real classroom kind of situation. Um, and I think okay. that's also maybe even better because it, it, it gives people the opportunity to practice between the, the different lessons. Um, and um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I've, I've been doing this for seven or eight years. And, um, um, and the more you do it and the more you work with it, the better you become at it. So um, that's really also when we started to, to design this whole framework and the, the especially the, the analysis part is uh, yes the theory is very important to understand but you also need to apply it in practice and that's really where where the value comes in so um, i would definitely recommend to do it as if you want to learn more about it to do it as an online course and to practice with those examples in the meantime Wonderful, thank you. Um, Katie has uh, got a supplementary question. I will come to the others as well, but supplementary on your answer. She's saying, can you add in specific criteria for that validation uh, and the business rules? Absolutely. So um, one of the um, packages within R that I use most is called uh, the tidy data package. Um, and that you can, I've literally not come across a validation or business rule that you cannot add. So um, um, almost everything you can imagine in terms of business rules and business logic that you would like to clean your data for, that's possible. Okay, thank you. Um, Calvin asks uh, uh, also two questions. Can MANOVA be used for the first case wine example can manova be used for the first case wine example thank you manover is is that a, a a term uh can, can you repeat the question one more time Estelle? i don't think i got it correctly 
Sorry, uh, Jan Willem, it's saying Manova. So maybe Calvin would like to um, expand on that question. And he's also asking how the significance of results uh, are tested. How yeah, are the so, results tested? Yeah, so I think uh, significance testing, um, accuracy testing, and those kinds of uh, techniques are, um, I would say, crucial because that basically makes or breaks your model. I've shown a real um, um, preview. I, I know I stepped over it a bit quickly in this webinar, but the way that we do that is by first building the model and applying it to a, a test group, and then we validate the model. And that, that's the, the separation I showed you in, in, um, in the example that I gave. Um, so there's always a training uh, class and, and a test class where we want to make sure that we really um, um, ensure that the model that we're building is accurate and has enough merit um, to be used on a larger data set. So that's a really good question and it's definitely necessary. Great. Um, Alec uh, is asking, are there sample question, examination questions available to build uh, familiarity with the course? So um, I, I will let you expand on on that, Jan Mellon, but I can say yes. And obviously, as a reminder that you have got the, the guidance available on the big data framework as well to go with that. But um, yes, so the, the obvious answer is yes. Um, um, basically, what we've done in the partnership with APMG is make sure that we follow the, um, I would say, the APMG best practice in the sense that there's always a sample uh, question paper available. Um, that's also available. Um, so um, there's two things you can do. First, we can download the book, which has all the more theoretical information, and then you can download the um, sample paper. Sample papers are distributed uh, through the ATOs. Um, so if you're, I don't know if Calvin's an ATO, but if if you are, you can um, find it on the APMG portal. And otherwise, you can request it at any of the big data framework partners in your area. Fabulous. Okay. And um, Calvin has has um, outlined the acronym that he gave us there for uh, for multivariate analysis of variance. So. Oh uh, yeah. Over to yeah, you then. Yeah. Then I exactly know. Yes, and then I know. Um, 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 exactly what he means and then the answer is definitely yes these kinds of uh, tests are necessary um, um, and also are already embedded into the the R packages that I showed you shown you before so multivariance testing is definitely done uh, to get a better understanding of how those variables relate to each other that's great. That's all the questions. Thank you so very, very much, Jan Willem, for your time today and expertise. Um, just a reminder that we will be sharing the slides and the contact details that you see in front of you here after the event. Um, and uh, Jan Willem, I know you're always incredibly generous and you're, you're happy to deal with people um, on uh, email or LinkedIn if they want to get in touch and ask any further questions. But uh, We'll, we'll bring it to a close now. Thank you very, very much indeed. And thank you everyone for coming. Yeah, I, um, some final words, um, Estelle. I would like also to thank everyone for taking the time to join today. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this or to, we're, we recently launched our um, Enterprise Big Data Ambassador Program in order to get uh, localized experts across the world. Um, so if you're interested in that, either reach out to me or Estelle, um, and that could really help with um, spreading the word and getting more people engaged with the knowledge sharing about how do you do this effectively. So thanks so much for, for hosting Estelle, and uh, it was really a pleasure to host this webinar with you again. And likewise, and we've got lots and lots of huge thank yous coming in as well, Jan Willem, which I'll share with you afterwards. So thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you.